Good evening and welcome to Left, Right and Centre. I'm Vishnu Shom and with our team of Uma Shankar Singh and Ashok Mahalai, I'm in the Ukrainian town of Borodyanka. This is the town which has been worst devastated in the entire area north of Kiev. And I came across this. I stopped the car because I saw it in the distance. It's just a reminder of how awful war is. This giant teddy bear, or call it what you like, obviously belonging to a child. And right next to it, the carcass of a cat. There's a broken cell phone. There's a cell phone battery. And there's a little umbrella over here. I don't know. To me, this seems to be, this seems to be the home of a child at some stage. And this entire area where I'm in right now, this entire block has been destroyed. So you can see this one part of this entire block, which Ashok is focusing on. And then on the opposite side of where I am right now, you can see the other block. And the entire area, this is the other block, and the entire area in between has been completely obliterated. It's been completely totally destroyed. So tonight, on left, right and centre, we are going to be talking about the story of Borodyanka and the incredible losses that people over here have seen, their lives being destroyed, their homes being destroyed, people, family members, it's all gone. And all you have at the end of the day is stuff like this remaining, a child's teddy bear. We are now just about to enter Borodyanka. This is one of the areas which has been worst hit uh, by the Russian shelling. In fact, you'll be able to see absolute devastation. What the Russians were doing, uh, what the Ukrainians in fact were doing throughout is preventing Russian access to many of these areas. So as you can see, uh, this is a bridge which was destroyed. Is somehow or the other managing to get down. We've got an SUV with us and um, we are now proceeding in the direction of Borodyanka. Absolute devastation and it's a fairly steep slope uh, that we need to get on top of uh, in order to get to Borodyanka. If we weren't able to, to navigate this particular stretch, then it would be really difficult uh, to get to many of the areas. But a lot of cars are now trying this, and in the distance is the town of Borodyanka. And as we get there, uh, we'd be able to show you the extent of the devastation in this area, and we'll also try and speak to people on the ground. This home completely devastated. You've got a couple of uh, municipal workers and the rest trying to clear out some of the debris. But what's still unclear in Borodyanka is the number of civilian casualties. Now, before uh, coming over here, before coming over here, what we've in fact uh, been told, and we're going to be very careful about this, is that this area is strewn with landmines. And um, very often these are uh, not just pressure mines, where, you know, if you step on it, then it explodes, but also uh, mines which pick up vibration in the area. Uh, so that's a, that's a particular threat that we need to, to negotiate. So we're going to try and stick as far as possible to the main roads and to areas which have been designated to be safe. Because what the Russians actually did in all of these areas, as they were retreating from these areas, was to mine it to prevent the movement of Ukrainian forces forward in this area. Well, we are now in the town of Borodyanka. As you can see, there is widespread destruction all around. So we are actually going to go to one of the areas where we are told it's relatively safe to get to because the worry is of landmines and things like that in this area. This is a, a housing complex. It's an apartment complex which has been completely destroyed by the Russians. And as we've been saying repeatedly, as they retreated, they planted landmines which have slowly been diffused by and large by the Ukrainians. But the reason I actually stopped over here is Ashok, can you focus on that bear? This is obviously where a child once stayed. Uh, and it's, it's a vivid sort of reminder of, um, of what actually took place over here and the civilian loss of lives uh, which took place. Uh, you can come up over here a little bit more. As you can see over here, it's 
it's it's it's bizarre it's just in the middle of nowhere this building which has been completely obliterated there's this giant teddy bear of a child this used to be the home presumably of a child at some stage um and this is what this is what war does we've seen it all over the world and we are seeing it now first hand here in borodyanka the complete destruction of lives of families of homes this used to be where a child used to once stay um there's a a broken cell phone over here as well there's the carcass ashok will you come closer there's the the carcass of a a cat there's a carcass of a a cat over here there's a teddy bear there's an umbrella there's there's a broken cell phone over here there's a a bag of some sort with some devices there's a cell phone battery over here and this is just such a frightening reminder of what war does and what it leaves out of nowhere this giant teddy bear is left just focus up here ashok and you can see um this building this it and you know ashok you can focus on both sides the point is this entire area in between has been destroyed this area in between has been completely destroyed as you can see it's it's unbelievable what what one comes across when we were in borodyanka earlier today we came across the prosecutor of the international criminal court the justice was over here he deployed a team over here in ukraine in the past but he wanted to get a first hand idea of the allegations of atrocities they're very strong allegations so we traveled a little bit with him walked a little bit around with him and he gave us this interview where he spoke about some of the seriousness of the allegations which is why the investigations continue Could you tell us sir, what brings you to Borodyanka specifically amid so many reports of Russian atrocities? I think probably the same thing that's brought you here. Right. It's the reports that uh crimes within the court's jurisdiction, the jurisdiction of the International Criminal Court uh may have been committed. Uh, I sent a, a team of investigators here yesterday. We're working also I mean shown around by the uh prosecutors uh, of Ukraine right. and the investigators here. So I want to have my own impression uh of uh some of the allegations here in Borodyanka we went to uh other uh, towns yesterday as well and we'll keep on doing our job to make sure we get to the truth and how long is the process going to take the process will take as long as it needs but we're trying to deploy focused investigations we have forensic uh crime scene officers we have investigators analysts uh, and lawyers and we have to deal with some uh, focus with some urgency so we can get to the truth but uh as i said yesterday there's uh, allegations of of war crimes crimes against humanity uh, and crimes within the jurisdiction of the court throughout of Ukraine right uh from Mariupol to uh of course uh, um where we're standing today right. and we need to conduct uh, investigation so we don't just rip on rumor right. and speculation right. but can make sure that we get to the truth and whatever we receive we have to scrutinize it yes and uh, check it's uh, authentic it's reliable right. it's not fake uh, and it's truthful and we do that also by conducting our own investigations mm -hmm. as well as subjecting whatever we receive to proper independent scrutiny and on the basis of what you've seen so far are you in a position to make any conclusions i'm in the position to keep investigating right and uh, as i said yesterday uh, we're here for a reason we made determinations that uh, there's reasonable grounds to believe that crimes within the jurisdiction of the international criminal court have been committed ukraine uh, filed two declarations in 2014 and 15 accepting the jurisdiction of the court it's their territory and so uh, we are investigating crimes of this magnitude to see whether or not um, they've been committed if so who's responsible and yeah. then we will put proper 
uh, cases if necessary before the judges and they'll make determinations. Could there be a tribunal eventually looking at these allegations if they're born out to be very serious? Well, we have one. It's called the International Criminal Court. Right, no, but in terms of specifically targeting Russia with this partic particular set of allegations? I'm not targeting any country. I'm looking at crimes or all parties to a conflict, whether Ukrainians, whether they're Russians, have responsibilities to uh, comply with the laws and customs of war. They have an obligation to comply uh, with uh, uh, the Rome Statute obligations right. because Ukraine has accepted the jurisdiction right. and uh, we will look uh, you know, with an open mind uh, uh, looking at the investigations, sure. conducting investigations and uh, we will make determinations based upon evidence right. and that's what's required by independent investigators, independent prosecutors um, and uh, let the you know, dice fall where they may. I mean we have to uh, do our job and at the end uh, right. we will have hopefully a better picture of what took place and who, if anybody, is responsible. For several hours today, we actually travelled around the town of Borodyanka looking for people who were in the town when the Russians had occupied it. And we were looking out for accounts to independently corroborate reports that Russian soldiers had committed excesses. One of the women we spoke to, in fact, confirmed that she was in touch with a young woman who told her that she had been raped by Russian soldiers. This is her account of what she saw and her conversation with that young woman. She lived during the war all the time and she, she saw everything. Were you alone or with your family? Uh, she, um, she was with her family. She had a daughter and um, the husband of her daughter. Yeah. Were you scared? You must have been very scared. Uh, why did you not leave? Почему вы не уехали? Спрашиваю. А потом, когда собирали людей на эвакуацию, расисты, они обстреливали машины, обстреливали автобус, они давали выезжать. Because when there was organized buses for evacuation, yeah. so uh, the Russian troops are shooting these buses. So she's scared that if she go to the evacuation bus, she, was, she would be killed by Russians. Did you see the Russians shooting? Did you see the Russians shooting the bus? Вы видели, как русские расстреливали автобусы? Я не видела, как расстреливали, потому что мимо нашего дома по Симашка я нахожусь. Десять машин, я их написано было дети. Только они выехали за территорию конца улицы, и я слышала, как стреляли. She didn't saw the buses, but uh, uh, near her home yeah. um, there was a cars with uh, children yeah. with their, uh, huge uh, letters children yes. and just moved through her house just turn around and the Russians were destroyed shoot the that cars the, the car had children in it yeah yeah, yeah a lot of cars how, how did you see this with your own eyes yeah yeah she saw it yeah could you ask her could you ask her to describe what she saw this car with children uh, which was short. Just describe it. Вот просто описать вот эти вот машины с детьми и что вы там видели. Я знаю, что у меня соседка, которая живет вот для меня через забор, ее сына убили, похоронили мы его во дворе. А сколько ему лет было? Ему 57 лет. Он ходил у него дом здесь на конце улицы, и он ходил каждый день, проверял дом, чтобы разбитый, очень разбитый. Her neighbor, her neighbor was killed. He was uh, 57 years old. But what about the children in the car? А что с детьми в машинах что-нибудь? Я видела сама лично 10 машин, написано было на стекловом, на стекле написано дети, дети, дети. She saw 10 cars and was wrote on it, uh, children, children, children. On and did she see the, the bodies of the children? А вы видели тела детей? Нет, я не видела, это потому что ходили еще расисты, ходили, не ходили по домам, взламывали двери, взламывали все. Моей дочке 38 лет. Я ее побежала к соседке, спрятала под кровать, одежды закидали, чтобы они не изнасиловали и не убили ее. No, she didn't saw, didn't see, because uh, they were uh, hiding under the beds, and um, the Russians uh, get broken the flats, yes. get broken and so and uh, raped the girls so she trying to hide her daughter how old is your daughter uh, 38 so you you know of 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 little girls who were raped you personally know 
Вы знаете кого-нибудь, кого изнасиловали? Кого изнасиловали, я не знаю, но когда мы когда она была, бомбили, дом разбомбили, вот этот магазин есть, фора. Мы ходили с дочкой, хотели хлеба, какой-то кусок хлеба, какое-то пропитание найти, хоть что-нибудь покушать. Там девушка была такая высоченька роста, была одета, на улице было минус 9, она одела на себя еще халат. Я говорю, бежим, давай бегом, бежим, бежим, танки едут, расисты едут. Она скажет мне, мне все равно, скажет мне, поймали русские. Связали, связали руки с кочем и глаза закрыли, и повезли себе в кабинет. А там, кажется, издевались, как хотели. И то есть, кажется, мне все равно. Uh, one girl, one girl, she was uh, a simple girl, so, and uh, she asking her to move out because the Russian tanks are going, yeah. uh, she saw that, yeah. uh, and the girl uh, said to her that uh, she don't care because a uh, few days ago the Russian soldiers took her to the, the, their base and many hours do what they want with her, so she don't care. Vlad, why don't you translate for us? Uh, did he see uh, people being captured by the Russians? Вы видели людей, которые были захвачены русскими? Захвачены каким-то образом или приняты сообщением? Нет, я видел только тех, которых убивали. He saw only that people who was killed. How have a lot of people been killed in Borodyanka? Много ли людей было убито в Borodyanka? Ну, из терробороны много. From the territory of defense, uh, people from the territory of defense was a lot. And uh, how many homes have been destroyed here? Most of them? Много ли домов вообще уничтожено? Какая степень разрушения в Ордянке? Это критическое. Почти, почти вся, вся эта самая центральная улица, если вы можете видеть. The whole central, the whole central, central street and uh, the critical. Yeah, yeah, critical. Uh, there are a lot of critical buildings in the city, and most of the buildings are in a critical status. Right. And why did he stay on? He had no choice. Was he not scared? Почему вы остаетесь? Вы не боитесь? Почему вы продолжаете оставаться здесь, Борди? Where I go, where I go. This is my land. I was born uh, not here, but. This is my land. Yes. It was his family here also. Was he a family? Anna Belaz. Not my family. My wife. Раньше умерла, скажи. She died. His wife. She died. During this war? No, no, no. Before the before the war. Before the war. Were you in Borodyanka for the last several weeks? Yes. What did you see? Что видел? Що я бачив, що я бачив. Найстрашніше це було десь до 18 березня. Взагалі... Before 18 March it was the scariest time. Неможливо взагалі було вийти не то, що я в приватному будинку зараз переселився. Вони не давали вийти навіть з будинку, тому що я жив біля аеродрома, і там вертольоти кружили прямо над будинком. He lives in his cell house, and he couldn't move out, because he lives near the airport. Right. How did you... And uh, the, the uh, Russian fighters all the time bombing and flying yeah. over, all over his house. How did you manage food and water? Как вы добывали еду и воду? Ну, сначала было страшно, так как приватный будинок у нас колодец был. Вода была. It was very scary, but uh, as he lives in his own house, so, so he have own water. Did you, did you ever feel that you may not survive? У вас було відчуття, що ви не вижите? Так. У мене було відчуття, знаєте, такого, що нас всі покинули, що ніколи це не закінчиться, що взагалі це назавжди. Тобто відчуття такої безпорадності. Коли б не було ні світла, ні газу, і саме найгірше, коли не стало зв'язку. Тобто ти не можеш ні до кого дозвонитися. Ось з цього будинку ми з криші ходили, там на дев'ятому поверсі трошки зв'язок пробивався. Ага. Так, це було дуже важливо. At that moment when he have no gas, he have no 
electrics, you know, yeah. communications, yeah. especially yeah. electricians. So they uh, go to that building yeah. on the ninth floor, yeah. and sometimes on the ninth floor there, yeah. Yeah. they have some uh, telephone uh, communications with right. other people. So right. they were scary. They mm, just um, thought that it's for forever. Yeah. This situation. And they, uh, I, that yeah. and scary because they was simply alone here. Yeah. Was your family with you? Uh, was Bless me, sir. No, my son is with my mom. Hvora, so I was looking at him, and I had to go to the bigger. There was a building with gas. I was worried. Yes, there was. So this is the view. In this house lives his mother, oh. and he uh, took. Uh, uh, and in this building was the gas. Right. So right, right. he come to the building and prepare for his mother right. some something to eat. Я вам скажу, знаєте, спасло єдине, що я познайомився тут у війну з людьми, яких я не знав до війни, і вони врятували мені життя і моїй матері. Це волонтери. Ліками, їжею і підтримкою. During the war here in Borodyanka he was met some people. He doesn't see them before, but they help him to survive and help his mother to survive. How old is your mother? Well, I'm glad that her name is Galia. And what is your name? My name is Sasha. Sasha. Thank you, Sasha, and I'm glad you made it. Thank you. Thank you, my friend. Thank you. The biggest danger of actually operating here in Borodyanka are landmines. This is a landmine which has actually been diffused a little while earlier on. Um, and uh, but there are a couple of signs like this and we've repeatedly been told not to uh, travel or get onto these grassy patches stick to the middle of the road which is what we are trying to do uh, this has been de demined which is why we are here but we need to be careful in this entire area because as we've been reporting the Russians have been um, planting mines or have planted mines all over the place as they retreated to prevent Ukrainian forces from actually gaining access to a lot of these areas. So that's uh, a reality over here. Behind me, as you can see, um, this building needs to come down because if it doesn't, it's going to just collapse at any stage. So you've got this heavy bulldozer trying to remove some of the rubble over there uh, and bring it down. Many of these buildings are, in fact, all of them will need to eventually be brought down because they would collapse at any stage at any time so that's another big worry over here just traveling over here comes with a, a whole set of risks but imagine what people over here uh, just be careful where you go behind uh, but people over here um, imagine those who actually survived Borodyanka and what they saw we also had an account of a woman who saw a young girl who says she was raped by Russian soldiers so these are also accounts that the International Court of Justice will be looking at very, very closely. The major military development today news that Russia's flagship of the Black Sea Fleet, the Moskva, one of the most heavily defended warships on Earth, has been crippled by Ukrainian forces. That really did make international headlines. It's almost unbelievable. This is no ordinary warship. This is a, a warship which is with a displacement of, of close to 12,000 tons. It carries 16 of the largest um, anti, uh, largest cruise missiles of their class called the Vulcan. Um, it's extremely heavily defended with uh, a suite of SAN-6 surface to air missile systems, what is <coughs> called the S-300 uh, missile system. The fact that this could in fact be attacked successfully by a couple of Ukrainian Neptune missiles, these are anti-ship guided missiles as has been alleged, seems to be almost unbelievable. Now, we don't know what the exact status of the ship is, whether it is still afloat or it has sunk, uh, but Russia has confirmed uh, that it sustained major damage. With this, the, the strongest element of Russia's Black Sea fleet has been destroyed or crippled, uh, will not be able to be used, this warship, anytime soon, if indeed it's still afloat.